Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre, for that introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's still in London, good morning, but I know it's good afternoon here. So, uh, I run something called Agriculture for Impact at Imperial College, and two of my staff, uh, Katie has got a phone, standing with a phone there, and Liz has been signing you in, uh, work with me. We're funded by Bill and Melinda Gates, not really as a lobbying group, but simply as a group that's meant to be uh, persuading European donors, that means both government and private, to do more about agriculture in Africa. And it's very much an evidence-based group. The book, we, Katie helped me write the book and we took a couple of years to do it. And many of you will see the subtitle, Can We Feed the World? Uh, and the answer is yes. If that's what you're after, you can leave now because you now know what the answer is. But of course, it's a, it's a but yes. It's yes, but. And in the last chapter, there are 24 qualifications to the yes. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some of those. Uh, we face uh, three big challenges. Recurring food price spikes, the fact that there's about a billion hungry, and that we have to feed the world by 2050. Uh, we're in the beginning of a third food price spike. You can see uh, on, at the right here, uh, begun uh, two or three months ago. Uh, it doesn't look as though it's going to shoot up the way the previous ones did. I mean, maybe we've learned a lot. Maybe uh, the AMIS program, the market information has helped. Uh, I think some changes to uh, the regulations around speculation and so on have also helped. I'm not sure which of those. The important thing about the spikes is twofold. One is that, at least in Africa in particular, we need more regional trade. We need to build up the trade so that surplus grain, for example, somewhere like Malawi, which is now producing a surplus over its own consumption, can be easily shipped across to the west or to the north, the same from Kenya to Ethiopia and elsewhere. So that's the first one. The second is that we actually need more food. For the last 10, 20 years, supply and demand has, has not always matched. Uh, there's often been a, a lack of supply at times of demand. And into the future, we're going to need more food. And I think that's crucial. <coughs> Secondly, we've got, according to the FAO's latest calculations, 800 and something or other million people who are chronically hungry. The most shocking statistic is the one that Jean-Pierre talked about earlier, that about 180 million children are under height for their age, and they grow up stunted. It's about over 40 million in Af sub-Saharan Africa. And the problem there is that you can't simply rely on economic growth or even agricultural growth to solve the problem. You have to be targeted. You have to target children under the age of five, and you have to target the mothers of children under the age of five. The critical period is weaning. Well, you, uh, apparently it's not a PC term to use the word weaning now, but anyway, I think you all know what weaning is. The point here is that in great many parts of Africa and developing countries as a whole, people take the basic cereal and mash it up into some form that helps a, a child to begin to take solid food. So for example, in, in Asia, mothers often boil the rice and they take the milky liquid on top of the rice and feed the baby with that, thinking somehow that it's a bit like milk. Well, it may look like milk, but it ain't milk. None of those crops, none of those basic cereals have got the micronutrients. They may have the carbohydrates and the protein, but they don't have vitamin A, and they don't have zinc, and they don't have iron, and other micronutrients too. And that's what's causing this terrible problem. So you've got to improve the diets of babies that are weaning, you've got to improve the diets of uh, those living up to two years old, and you've got to improve the diets of mothers, not just when they're pregnant and lactating, but in their growth as young girls. And the third is, that we have to feed the world by 2050. And there's a whole range of uh, drivers, demand and supply, which I won't go into, but we go into in the book, that affect that. Interestingly, when you talk, most people say, oh, it's population increase that's causing the problem. 
And actually, if it was only population increase, we could solve it easily because the increases in agricultural production are more or less keeping pace with the growth in population as such. The big problem is not the fact that the population is growing, but the fact that the population with money is growing. Mm -hmm. Per capita incomes are going up all around the world, particularly in emerging countries, particularly in China and in India, Vietnam, Brazil, Korea and so on. And with that is a shift in diet. People in developing countries are eating crisps and chips and bread. And in particular, livestock products, milk, yogurts, cheeses, pork, <coughs> lamb, etc. And all those livestock need to be fed themselves. I mean, very crudely, you need about seven kilos of grain per kilo of meat, but uh, that depends upon what the livestock system is. But you get a sense of the order of magnitude there. China recently signed an agreement with Ukraine giving them $3 billion in loans in return for shipping 5 million tons of maize to, uh, to China for uh, livestock consumption. I was on a farm in Iowa just recently, and the maize and the soybean, in particular soybean, going to the railhead, going out to the Pacific Northwest, loaded in ships to go to China to feed the animals that the Chinese are using. That's the big problem. There are many other problems which I don't want to talk about, but just the one I really want to stress here is, is climate change. Climate change is happening. If you go into any village in Africa and say, is the climate changing? They say, yes, of course it is. And you'll say, well, what's happening? And they'll tell you what's happening. And you say, are you doing anything about it? And they say, yes, of course we are. And they'll tell you what they're doing about it. Whatever skeptics say here in the West, if you go to an African village, they're convinced the climate is changing. Whether it's climbing, changing for anthrop anthropogenic reasons or for others is still debatable, but it's changing. So, for example, uh, up on the left there is the growing season. It's getting shorter. I was in northern Ghana last year. The rains came a month late. They finished a month early. So it was only 100 days to grow crops. And temperatures themselves. We know now from... Massive experiments in Africa that maize yields go down by 1.7% for every degree day above 30 degrees, right? So if you've got a day that's 31 degrees, the maize yield will go down by 1.7%. If it's 32 degrees, it'll go down by 3.4%. If it's 32 degrees for two days, it'll go down by 4. Point, I'm, I'm getting lost there, but you know what I mean. So we know what will happen with increasing temperatures. And of course, in addition to that, we're, see, we're seeing more extreme events, more frequent, more intense, more multiple events. This was a classic with the Russian heat wave and the Pakistani floods. The same weather event caused those. And we've just had that huge drought across uh, the United States, but also a drought in Eastern Europe. Now, you can't prove that any one of these is a consequence of climate change, but they're what the climate change models predict. Okay, so how do we cope? Well, if you boil down those 34 qualifications in the last chapter, we, quote, we can cope by innovation, by markets, by people and political leadership. And I'm just going to go through these really quite fast and you can pick up whatever you want to talk about on those. Start with innovation. Uh, there's a lot of Af innovation going on in Africa. Africans didn't invent mobile phones, but they sure as hell learned how to use them in extraordinarily innovative ways. Kenyans use mobile phones in ways that are much more sophisticated than the way we use mobile phones here in the West. Maasai can sell their animals in Nairobi on the phone and get the deposit on their animals put to their credit on the phone and then drive them down to Nairobi and then finish the deal. The, the challenge here is what we would call sustainable intensification. Going forward, because there isn't a lot more pristine land to be used for agriculture, I mean there is in the Congo and there is in, in the Amazon, but if you leave that aside, there's not more fresh land to be added to for agriculture. You have to produce more yields on the same amount of land with less water, less pesticides, less fertilizers, low emissions of greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide and uh, carbon dioxide. That's what sustainable intensification is about. And at the same time, 
you have to increase the natural capital that's there and the flow of environmental services and do it in a manner that's resilient. That is a huge task. We're going to have to do a more of this by 2050. And that's why we need innovation. It's not simply taking existing technologies and making sure that farmers use them. We need new technologies that are more sustainable and intense. One example, microdosing. You put the fertilizer in the top of a Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola or whatever other kind of cola you like, and you put that in a hole with the maize seed. That way you get the right amount of fertilizer without spreading it all over the land. Part of the answer is agricultural ecology. And I should stress here that I am by profession, I have got lots of degrees in the subject, an ecologist. Applying ecological principles to design agricultural practices, agroforestry, integrated pest management, organic farming, and so on. And there are many examples, and I'm only going to give a few. One is conservation farming, the notion that you don't use the plow. So this is in Zambia. You, you, you harvest the, the maize and, and cut the stalks and lay them on the ground so they rot down into the ground. You don't use a plow. That way the soil becomes more organic, that way it retains greater water. And this is a, a farmer and, and, or rather two farmers, one farmer and her husband, uh, they're producing seven tons of maize per hectare on that bit of land in Zambia. Uh, another example I like to talk about is this tree called Phytherbia, which is a leguminous tree uh, which has the extraordinary habit of shedding its leaves in the wet season. And so you, you put the maize under that tree, as you can see there, and you can get three tons per hectare with no fertilizer because it's a leguminous tree and it provides a nitrogen. It also provides a lot of organic matter into the soil. So you can get something like two tons of carbon put back per hectare every year. But you also need this so is the other aspect of sustainable intensification. You also need modern plant breeding. You need new varieties that are more nutritious, more resilient to threats, including climate change, and more efficient varieties that will, for example, convert sunlight into uh, uh, in plant material, sunlight into food. That's what the, some of the big targets are. Sorry, I, I realize I'm blocking the whole thing, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep moving around. Uh, one example, going back to the notion of nutrition, I was in Mozambique uh, two weeks ago. The Mozambicans eat sweet potato, like many people in Africa, but the sweet potatoes are white colored, and they have no vitamin A in them. But what they've done now is to bring in varieties which have got orange flesh and have got the vitamin A in them, or the beta carotene, which is the precursor of vitamin A, been crossing them within Mozambique. I've now got a, a range of, actually a range of 15 new varieties that are drought tolerant. Uh, and the great thing about sweet potato is you not, not only can eat the potato, you mash it up and children will uh, take it, you can also eat the leaves, they're also highly nutritious, you can cook them up in oil. And uh, this is the, on the left there, the, the tea party that they provided for me with an incredible array of sweet potato. Uh, of, of different dishes. The, um, the jug contains a, a, sm a smoothie-like substance. <laughs> the great thing about this work on orange flesh sweet potato is it's been very much run by Africans. It's been run by the ministry in Africa, by the National Institute of Agronomy, and by a, a woman called Maria Andrade, who's from the Cape Verde Islands, who's been working there for nearly 20 years on this problem. What they have is the evidence they know it works, that, that farmers will take it up, farmers will grow it, that children will eat it, and that when children eat it, they take in more beta carotene, and that you can measure the increase in vitamin A in the blood serum. I mean, the final phase of that is to show that they are uh, not under height for their, way, for their age, but that's coming along. So we are now getting real evidence, and that's enough, I think, to spread this, not just across Mozambique, but elsewhere in Africa. Of course, in some cases, you haven't got the gene in 
the crop as you have it with orange flesh sweet potato. Uh, in the case of rice, rice doesn't contain the, the vitamin A uh, precursor. And so in that case, you actually have to insert that gene through a, a genetic modification. And that's what the golden rice is doing that'll be released probably within the next couple of years. And there's now, at the bottom right here, a golden banana, which is being developed by the government of Uganda. It's not private sector, it's the government of Uganda is developing that with pro-vitamin A in the bananas. And uh, they're just the early stages of that. And going forward, just one example of what we have to aim for is to get cereals to fix the nitrogen. And that means getting bacteria into the roots of cereals to cre creation of nodules so that you won't need to apply fertilizer because cereals are doing it themselves. That would be an extraordinary achievement. It, until recently people thought it was impossible, but now we know how the bacteria got in there in the first place several million years ago. So there's a real possibility and there's a big Gates um, grant to John Innes in Britain to try and see if we can't get that to happen. Those are just some examples. And of course, what we're really after here are win-win-wins. We're looking for uh, increased food security, but also to conserve natural resources, also to reduce greenhouse gases. It's a big task, and a task which I think the European Commission has got a great role to play. Markets. Markets are crucial. Local markets like this, but also markets for inputs and outputs. Let me give you an example. This is northern Ghana. This is a program of the Alliance for Green Revolution for Africa. The man at the top there is the uh, lead farmer in a farming association. And he said uh, he's been helped by the Savannah Agricultural Research Institute to grow soybeans better. They've shown him various things he could do to make the soybean harvest better. He deals with agro-dealers, which are little stores in the villages around. And he's got a couple of... Uh, People who they hire to go and get the best deal from the store to get the seed and the fertilizer. Uh, when he produces the soybean, he markets it through the Savannah Farmers Cooperative Association, which is owned by the farmer associations, mm -hmm. and they get the best deal on prices. And they're also now building uh, warehouses over here where you can store the grain, you can make sure that it's at the right temperature and humidity so you don't lose the grain. And so you've got a circle here of various activities built on local institutions. And this is what we're after. Um, Jean-Pierre and I were talking earlier about the need for global public goods, which is like the, the genetic materials and so on that we talked about earlier. But the link between those and national public goods and the national public good in each country, as far as food security is concerned, is having an environment that is conducive to food security. So what you need here is to have the farm household in a local community, maybe in a co-op or a, a farm, other kind of farm association. You need agro-dealers over here that sell seed and fertilizer, that bring in microcredit from banks, that bring in high quality certified seed from seed companies. And there are lots of new seed companies springing up over Africa. So they can get the inputs they need. And over here on the left, you need links into local traders and into the markets as a whole. And for them to get a good price, they need to be in a community, in an outgrower group or a cooperative or something of that nature. And the point is that all of that is tied together by infrastructure, two kinds of infrastructure. Hard infrastructure, which means roads, soft infrastructure, which means ICT, mobile phones, and so on. Africa needs these enabling environments. And I think the European Commission has got a, a particularly pivotal role here in coordinating things to happen. The trouble is with most donors, they like to do one thing and not another. They say, oh, we love creating markets, but we hate building roads. Or we love building roads, and we don't really think you need anything more than some roads. I mean, every donor has got their own particular bias. I think what the Commission can do is to, is to oversee the relationship between donors and, and, and countries in terms of building these enabling environments. Because that's the way in which innovation 
would get into practice. That's the way farmers will not just be able to feed themselves, but make money. And farmers need to make money. They need money for education for their kids, and they need money for medicines, and in some cases to buy more food. And then people. It's important to recognise we have half a billion smallholders in the world. That is, farmers with less than two hectares. And it may be that into the future, in Africa in particular, we'll have a lot more big farms. But for the next 10, 20, 30 years, food security is going to depend on smallholders with less than two hectares. And they need the links. They need the links to the markets. And also women. It's important to recognise that women are not just farmers, they're also mothers. Or if you like, they're not just mothers, they're also farmers. It depends upon how you want to put it. They're responsible for growing nutritious foods and they're responsible for ensuring their children eat the nutritious foods in one way or another. So they're crucial to this push to get um, better nutrition. And of course, as we all know, one of the big problems is that in the extension services, extension services are entirely dominated by men and the men only go and talk to men and the women get left on the side. The other point to make is that people are at the heart of what I would call a virtuous circle. If you start off with getting greater yields, those in turn will produce more prosperous farmers, more wage labour, less hunger, the rural economy grows, more rural employment, more roads and markets, greater trade opportunities, agriculture develops and so on. What's that saying is that agriculture is at the heart of rural economy and at the heart of rural development. Agriculture is the best way of reducing poverty in rural areas and the best way of getting the rural economy to grow and that in turn is crucial to getting the urban economies and the industrial economies to grow. Agriculture has got that key role as we go forward. But all of this will only really work with political leadership. That's, for those of you who don't recognise him, that's President John Kafour, who's the president of Ghana for uh, a number of years, uh, 2002 to 2009. It's partly about political leadership in the, in the West. And you can recognise, I think, most of the people on that uh, screen. And I also, I, I clearly now need to balance that by putting Jean-Pierre up there, and I will do that once I get a good photograph. Perhaps you'll pose for me, Jean-Pierre. But it's, we've got uh, three leaders who are, are really outspoken about agriculture, Obama, Cameron, and, and Commissioner Pierbanks, and then some key people who are making it happen, uh, Raj Shah, who came from the uh, Gates Foundation, and Justin Greening, the Secretary of State in the UK. But these three big donors are really what is what's making uh, the Western input to agriculture is so important. But what happened in Ghana is a very good lesson. Uh, under Kafour's leadership and with other presidents, <coughs> there was more investment, A, in roads, B, in research. And the, the production of cocoa went up, but so did the production of cassava and yams. So you've got their annual average growth in agriculture at 5% per annum for 20 years. And what was most remarkable, you look at the orange bars there, that's the proportion of children under five who are underweight. It's gone down from 30% in 1988 down to under 17% in 2008. Ghana is going to be the first and maybe the only African country to achieve the Millennium Development Goal of halving poverty and hunger. It's a great achievement. And it's part of the reason why I get optimistic. The reason I'm optimistic is that everywhere you, you go in Africa, you can find things that work. You can find projects and programs. You can find all kinds of experiments. You can even find countries where it works, like Ghana. And the challenge is how we replicate that on a bigger scale. Thank you. I should just say that you, I know some of you have got the book, some of you haven't got the book, and I think you can sign up to get the book. Uh, in addition to the book, there's a website called canwefeedtheworld.org, and basically we are putting on that website material as it comes up that's relevant to the book. Thank you.